Hello, and welcome to today's ACM SIGSOF webinar. This webcast is part of ACM SIGSOF's commitment to provide value to its current and future members. The ACM SIGSOF webinar series features speakers from the Future of Software Engineering track at the International Conference of Software Engineering, as well as select keynote speakers and distinguished paper authors. I'm Robert Dyer, Assistant Professor at Bowling Green State University, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slide in front of you. First, the slides will advance automatically throughout the events. On the bottom panel, you will find a number of additional widgets and resources. If you're experiencing problems with the slides or audio, press the F5 key in Windows, Command-R on a Mac, or refresh your browser on mobile devices. Or you can close and relaunch the presentation. To control volume, adjust the master volume on your computer. If you have questions during the webinar, please type them into the Q&A box at any time during the webinar and click the Submit button. At the end of the presentation, we will have time to respond to questions. This session is being recorded and will be archived. You will receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available. Today's presentation is Basic Concepts of Measurement Theory. This is part one of four in the series on fundamentals of measurement and data analysis for software engineers. Today's speaker is Dennis Fraley. Dennis is a retired principal fellow from Raytheon, where he worked on software metrics and safety critical applications. He also served for over 40 years as an adjunct professor of computer science at Southern Methodist University, the University of Texas at Austin, and the University of Texas at Arlington. Dennis is an ACM fellow and an IEEE senior member. He was the 2008 recipient of the ACM Lifetime Achievement Award in Computer Science Education and the 2013 recipient of the IEEE Computer, Sci Computer Society's CSEET Nancy Mead Award for contributions in support of software engineering education. Dennis, without further ado, take it away. Okay, Robert. Let's get started. Uh, I want to begin by uh, giving you this little picture of where we are. Today, the four courses in this series, four webinars, are very basic uh, information about uh, measurement and analysis of data. And they are covering material that is pretty fundamental, but is very important and based on what I've seen is frequently misused because people don't seem to be totally aware of these things. So. Uh, today's uh, webinar is very, very, very basic concepts, a lot of definitions and things like that. But one important uh, thing we're going to do is once we get through the first two bullets there, we're going to talk about scales of measure, which is probably the single most important thing we're going to cover today. And we're also going to talk about sample size, which is also important. And uh, those will both be very important in terms of understanding the subsequent uh, courses or webinars in this series. I uh, also want to refer you to a textbook called Software Metrics, A Rigorous and Practical Approach by Norman Fenton and James Beeman. This book is the, uh, if you will, the much more in-depth coverage of the material in these four webinars. And of course, it goes beyond, well beyond what we're covering in these webinars. But if you want more information about anything we talk about, this is the place to look. Also, you'll notice on the lower right-hand corner of each slide, there's a sl slide number. So if you have a question that is specific to a particular slide, please be sure to let me know by get, saying slide number such and such. And that way, and during the Q&A, we can uh, refer to that slide and pull that slide up. All right, so let's talk about the introductory issue of what are we measuring and why are we measuring it? Uh, this is from Norman Fenton's book. Uh, he says, the ultimate goal of software metrics is to help software professionals make decisions under uncertainty. Now, the, the point here is that we don't know everything. Our knowledge is imperfect. And what we do with measurement is we try to essentially improve the odds that we will make the right decision. 
but it doesn't guarantee that we are making the right decision. So it's, it's important to keep that in mind. Metrics helps you be more likely to make the right decision. Another point that he makes is that we have to make decisions in life, but we can't always be certain about them. And what we do is we use metrics to help us make the decisions uh, with a little bit better and hopefully a lot better odds that we're making the right decision. Uh, one of the things about metrics or measurement is that what we measure isn't necessarily accurate, isn't necessarily interpreted properly, isn't necessarily representing what we want it to represent. We'll see that as we go through this. But despite that fact, we still use the metrics to improve our chances. And, and again, uh, I'm sort of a little bit redundant here, but I want to emphasize the idea that the whole idea of metrics is to improve our chances, improve our odds of making a good decision. Now, another quote from Fenton that I particularly like, uh, it's from the very beginning of his book. He says, metric measurement is a process by which we take numbers or symbols and assign them to the attributes of entities in the real world. And we're going to explain attributes and entities in a subsequent slide. But the idea is measurement is assigning numbers or symbols. We do so in such a way as to describe the attributes of entities in according to some set of rules. Now that seems, you know, what are we really talking about there? It sounds like a lot of uh, academic type words. But the idea is we want to distinguish between the thing we are measuring, which is an attribute of something, the size of something, the weight of something, the extent of something, the speed of something, from the symbols or the numbers that we use in order to describe that. And we're going to see that as we go along, that we, we need to separate those two concepts because the numbers or symbols are used to represent something, but they aren't the same as the thing we are measuring or describing. There's another little point that I'm going to uh, address a little more in depth in a few slides, but I'll just throw it up here. The assignment of numbers must preserve intuitive and empirical observations about the attributes and entities. I'll explain that in a subsequent slide. But let's talk about what we mean by an entity. An entity could be an object such as people or computers or teams or companies. It's something that we want to know something about. Or it could be an event such as a project or a semester in school or a contest. Entities have characteristics that we want to understand, such as their capability, their speed, their cost. That's the reason we want to measure them. The attributes are the characteristics or features or properties. Now, those could be color, shape, area, price, and the idea here is that the property may or may not be representable by a number, but that's why we talk about the idea of using symbols as well as numbers to represent things. Sometimes something other than a number makes sense in terms of understanding the attribute. For example, here's an apple and an orange. We can distinguish them from each other by a number of attributes. For example, their color, or their shape, or their taste. Those are all examples of attributes of apples and oranges that enable us to distinguish them from each other. Or we may want to use it to do some evaluation. For example, we can weigh them and see which one weighs more. That may or may not be matter in a certain situation. We can compare them. We can evaluate them. 
So this is an example of where we're using the attributes to either distinguish them from each other or to compare them. Now, here's a little example to illustrate all this. So this is uh, something where somebody is evaluating five different uh, health insurance plans. And you'll notice that they are compared them according to various characteristics on the left and they have chosen one that they think is the preferred option. You know, the, the five options are the entities being measured, five different medical insurance plans. The column on the far left are the attributes that we are measuring, and there's price and there's various other things that we don't need to worry about the details, but the point is there's characteristics or attributes of these medical plans that we are trying to measure. Then in the center, you notice the values of those attributes. And you'll notice in this case, some of the values, for example, the very top row, are measured in terms of a number, namely the monthly price of the plan. The, many of the other attributes are represented by little symbols like a green circle with a check mark or a red circle with an X in it or something. So those are, it's, a, it's a set of symbols we use to measure the values of the attributes. And on the bottom, we have an attribute that we're measuring with stars. How many stars? And this is one of the important points here. Attributes are often measured by things other than numbers. For example, on the top left, you see a symbol that has to do with the size of clothing. And on the far right, you have shapes and colors that may be used. On the other hand, when you're measuring height as the lower right-hand corner, you'll see that a number seems to make sense in terms of what makes sense for measuring that attribute, the attribute of height. We measure in order to make things visible or to make them understandable or controllable. And you can imagine if you're the navigator on an airplane, you want to be able to make sure you know where you are and how far you are from various things like the ground. And uh, on the right, you have a weather map that's showing something that has to do with what temperature you're going to expect to see and so forth. And you'll notice that quote on the bottom, the goal of the scientist is to make things measurable. That's a concept that was introduced several uh, decades, in fact, several uh, thousand or at least several hundred years ago. Now, Let's talk about how this applies to software engineering. For software developers, the question is, are my requirements complete? Well, maybe you measure something. Is the design of high quality? Maybe there's a way to measure whether the design is good. Uh, is the code satisfying its requirements? There's some, maybe you have a measure of how many of the requirements are addressed by specific sections of the code or something like that. And the idea is for a software developer, there are many times when we want to measure something. For a team leader or a manager of a software team, you often want to measure things like the amount of money you're spending or whether you're going to be on time or not, are you on schedule. And that one on the bottom is one that I learned about working in industry. Uh, selecting the most competent software suppliers if you're hiring somebody else to do software for you. That can actually be a very challenging thing to do. Measurements are very powerful. They can tell you a lot. Unfortunately, it's very easy to misuse measurements as we're going to see. And this leads to the fact that you have to understand some basic rules and principles if you're going to use measurement properly, which is really the motive for this webinar. Measures should lead to useful information, which means every time you measure something, you should have a reason for measuring it. Typically, what you want is to get information to help you make a decision about something. So you have some data, 
you analyze the data and get some information. The important thing I want to focus on here is that middle part of that diagram, the analysis. Uh, I have done some work for companies where I found that they had a lot more data than they needed, but they didn't have very good information because they didn't do good analysis. And one of the reasons people don't do good analysis is that they can't justify it. They think it's an overhead function. But in fact, if you really want to get good information, you have to do analysis. And that's what this webinar is really all about, especially the, re the parts two, three, and four. So let's move on to some principles of measurement theory. Um, we'll consider several principles here. And first, before I consider principles of measurement theory, I want to make some observations. What I did is I searched through some of the history of software engineering and looked at some comments that were made many years ago, 20, 30 years ago, that are still true today. And I thought it was kind of interesting how much of this is still true today. The first one was a quote from 1995. Software engineering is still an aspiration because computer science is not a science. And if you think about what uh, Ruth was trying to say there, she was saying the computer scientists very often don't follow the scientific method and don't do truly scientific approaches to their work. And as a consequence, the engineering that utilizes computer science is not really an, a form of engineering. I think we've made some progress in that regard since 1995, but I think, as you may see from this webinar, we have a long way to go. Another quote was from a fellow named Alan Davis when he talks about what he calls lemming engineering, which is the idea that we do things blindly following the techniques that other people are using, but we haven't really done a scientific or engineering assessment of how appropriate those techniques are. How do we decide whether to use this language or that? Well, we don't really have a very scientific or systematic approach to that usually, for example. And finally, I have a quote from Norman Fenton that he wrote back in 1994 with an earlier version of the same book that I referred to earlier. And he basically says, the basis for software metrics lies in measurement theory, but, base, but nobody uses engineering or nobody uses measurement theory. And as a consequence, there's much theoretically flawed work in software metrics in the software engineering area. And his book has a number of very interesting examples that uh, a lot of people would say, well, wait a minute, I thought that was good solid material. And he basically says, no, from an engineering, from a software metrics theory point of view, this doesn't really hold water. And I think it's worthwhile doing that. And we're going to talk about some of these examples. Another thing I wanted to call your attention to is that one of the things that happened as a result of the kinds of quotes I just showed you is that the uh, standards community has developed a number of standards that apply to measurement. Uh, first of all, a vocabulary, and then a the 15939 uh, standard, which is the one in the middle, is a standard for how you should measure, what sort of process you should put together for measurement. And having gone through this in my industrial experience, I found that it, there's a lot of potential uh, me methods and concepts described in 15939 that most organizations don't bother to do, but they can make a big difference in the value of what you measure. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a later webinar, I believe. And uh, finally, the st standard for software development process, which is a fairly old one at this point, is still based on a lot of the same concepts. So let's talk about some terminology, just to go s get some terminology out of the way. A measure is a variable to which we assign a value as a result of measurement. And as an example, lines of code, 
this is something we might choose to use to measure the size of our software. And regardless of whether that's a good way to measure it or not, the point is it's a way to measure it. And it's called a measure. Data, as a plural noun, is a collection of values that are assigned to measures. Remember, measures are variables, so data are the values you assign to those variables. And as an example, there are some numbers which might represent the sizes of different computer programs. An attribute is a property or characteristic that we can distinguish in some quantitative or qualitative way. We can distinguish color, we can distinguish distance, and so forth. A base measure or a direct measure is something we can quantify directly. For example, we can measure the degrees of the temperature. We can measure the length in meters. We can measure the number of defects we found. It's just a number we can measure. By contrast, a calculation or a derived measure is something that does a calculation using other measures. So lines of code per month requires us to measure lines of code and to measure months and then do a calculation. So that's called a derived measure. Now, I mentioned earlier in Fenton's definition of what measurement is that paragraph about the assignment of numbers must preserve intuitive and empirical observations about the attributes of the entities. I want to focus on that now and give you some examples. Let's suppose I say house A is bigger than house B. Well, one of the things you should say is, how am I measuring size? Does my assignment of a number to size preserve my intuition as to what I mean by size? Now, here, here's an example. What do we really mean by size? In order to define a way to measure size, we have to say, what does size mean? And that is, we have a model that reflects a viewpoint. The model must specify what we're going to measure and the attribute that we want to measure. In other words, what do we want to measure and what do we want to know about it? So here's an example. Let's suppose we have a house and we want to know how big that house is. The entity is the house. The attribute is the size of the house. But what do we mean by size? Well, one way to measure size is based on how many people can comfortably live in that house. And if that's our objective, then we might choose to measure size by counting the number of bedrooms and the number of bathrooms. That's a very common scenario when someone is looking for a house, the real estate agent will say, how many bedrooms do you want? That's usually a very important thing. If you have so many children, you may want so many bedrooms. Or if you have a group of students looking for an apartment or renting a house, they say, well, how many of you are there? You probably each want your own bedroom, so how many bedrooms do you want? So your way to measure the size of the house may be in terms of how many bedrooms are there and how many bathrooms are there. On the other hand, let's suppose you are a person who builds houses. You might want to measure the size in terms of what will it cost to construct it? Something that gives you insight on the cost of construction. And the very common way to do that is to by measuring square feet of living space. So it's a different way to measure the size of a house, reflecting a different model for what it is that we want to know. Now let's apply the same concept to software. Suppose we're, somebody gives you a piece of software and they say you can run it on your computer and you say well how big is it well one way to measure it would be how much disk space does it occupy and if you're running it on a smartphone you may have a very limited amount of space in your storage and therefore you may be very concerned about physically how many bytes of memory it occupies 
And so you would measure software by bytes of memory. And different things would be different sizes. Another way of measuring the size of software would be related to the cost of constructing it. And one way to do that would be to say, well, how many requirements do we have to satisfy by this software? And one way to measure that would be the number of user stories, assuming you're using a methodology that involves defining requirements by means of user stories. So you might just measure them, and then you might have a more sophisticated measure where you measure the complexity of the user stories or something like that. Okay, so the idea there is that you have to define what you mean, what you're trying to understand before you can decide how to measure it. So now we're going to talk about scales of measure, which is, as I mentioned earlier, perhaps the most significant and important part of this whole webinar. When we are going to measure something, we are trying to understand the attributes. We can also use that to categorize things. And a good example is road signs. Anyone who's learned to drive is, recalls some kind of a section of their driver training where they talk about the shape and the color of road signs and how that is used to tell us things. For example, a diamond-shaped sign in yellow, at least in the U.S., is a warning, whereas a rectangular shape in white is providing information. So we know from the shape and the color something about the nature of what that sign is telling us about, and that affects how we use that information when we're driving. So let's talk about scales of measure. A scale of measure, sometimes called a level of measurement or sometimes simply called a scale, is essentially nothing more than a collection of symbols or numbers that we use to classify a particular uh, attribute of something. Now, it's, it's, that's a very generic description, but we'll say more in a moment. Another way of looking at a scale is it's a classification system for describing something. There are many scales in use. And if you do some research on scales, there's all kinds of things you can look into. But for our purposes, the most commonly used scale is what's called uh, Stanley Smith Stevens classification. This was developed originally for psychological research in the 1940s, and it has been adopted by many, many people for many, many purposes and it's very appropriate for us to think of this scale and apply this scale for software engineers. There are four levels of scales, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. And the idea here is that as you move down that list, you get more desirable properties that enable you to do more sophisticated forms of analysis. Now, there are many researchers who will come up with other scales and reasons why those other scales are appropriate for certain very specialized purposes. But for general use, the scale that Stanley Smith Stevens developed is the most widely used by far. And this is a pictorial view of his four scales. The vertical axis is how many useful characteristics the scale has. And the four, character, four are nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. And as you can see, they, as you move up the, the, the thing on the right, as you move further to the right, you have more useful characteristics for an analyst, an analytical purposes. Scales help us understand what we are seeing. Uh, think about color. 
color is a it's a scale it's an example of a scale it's it's it turns out it's an example of one of Stanley Smith Stevens's types of scales but color is a way to distinguish things we can look at these marbles and say well we have blue ones and black ones and red ones and so forth but there's no ordering there's nothing in the nature of that scale that color scale that says one of them is higher than another or whatever whereas if you take height and you measure it no matter how you measure height there is a natural order to height so it's an example of a scale that has uh, some slightly more powerful characteristics for analysis purposes so let's begin by talking about nominal scales a nominal scale is a scale that enables you to categorize things but with no ordering we've already seen color as a good example you can say we have blue ones and black ones and red ones but there's no ordering involved here's an example of a nominal scale that occurs very often in software engineering the origin of your defects you're doing testing and you discover a bug and you might choose to categorize that bug as being related to bad requirements related to design related to development technique or related to the testing process and the idea here is that it's a way of categorizing your defects by where did they come from what what activity did we do wrong that resulted in that defect but there's no ordering there's nothing that says design related defects are more important than development related defects or anything like that it, there may turn out to be but that's not what the scale is here it's a it's a simple nominal scale it categorizes without doing anything else nominal scales have the primary characteristic is that they enable you to categorize things often in terms of such qualities as shape or color or whatever you can count the frequency of each category in other words you can say we have more black ones than red ones but you well it turns out because of that you can determine which category has the largest number in other words there the which one, which marble do we have the most of well we have it turns out we have the most black ones and blue is second and yellow is third and red is the least so you can count the frequency with which each category occurs but there's nothing in terms of ordering of the individual character categories statistically speaking the term the mode as we'll we'll see in the next uh, webinar is what's called it's the most frequent one and so with an if you have data in a nominal scale you can determine which one is most frequent that's called the mode but you cannot determine any kind of natural order and it turns out there's no such thing as a average or a median you can't say what is the average color of the marbles that's a meaningless statement here are some other examples of nominal scales that are quite commonly encountered and uh, I'm sure you could come up with lots of others you can use numbers to categorize these things but there's no numerical meaning in terms of the attribute you're measuring for example let's suppose I have a bunch of animals in the zoo and I have tigers elephants and horses and I uh, for I randomly assign the number one to tigers and two to elephants and three to horses maybe just for what bin I put their food in or something and just because I have assigned a number doesn't mean anything about the relationship between them for example tigers are not more important because they have the number one and horses are not three times as valuable because they have the number three there's no numerical meaning to those numbers and the reason this is an important point is because too often when we assign numbers to categorize things 
we make the mental connection and think, well, there's some meaning to the number. But in fact, in this case, it's simply a random assignment of symbols. We could have said tigers are blue and elephants are red and horses are green. It would have been a, a, a comparable way of doing things. Okay, now let's talk about ordinal scales. Ordinal scales are one step up from nominal. And in an ordinal scale, there is a ranking or an ordering to the data. A good example is military rank, general higher than colonel, who's higher than lieutenant, and so forth. That's an ordinal scale. Software example, you might be measuring the severity of your defects, and you might have minor, significant, or major defects that you assign according to some system. So there's a ranking or an ordering there. Another example, uh, there's a certain sort of weight range that is used to determine the sizes of dogs, according to at least some standards. But the main thing is it enables you to put things in some kind of an order. An ordinal scale an, is you can place them in some order, and you can sort them according to the order. And a good example is you could take all the different people in a military organization and line them up by rank. You can determine the middle item, the median. And that's useful, but you cannot determine an average. It doesn't make sense to compute what is the average rank. There's no mathematical relationship between the categories. And that's an important point here. Now, in ordinal scales, there's lots of examples, and it turns out that there are many examples in the software engineering world, and that's one of the reasons this is an important topic. But let's look at some other examples. You go to a hospital, and a friend is in the hospital, and they say, what's the condition? Well, they may give you one of these five words, and there's an ordering there, but there's not a mathematical, mathematical relationship. Uh, you look at restaurant ratings. Um, the degree of distance between categories is not defined. So although you can determine which one is in the middle, but you cannot determine an, an average. You can't do the mathematical calculation for an average. Okay, now let's move up one more to what's called an interval scale. In an interval scale, not only do you have an ordering, but there is a fixed distance between consecutive members of the sequence. For example, dates. With dates, there's a fixed distance, namely one day between each consecutive value. And therefore, given any two dates, you can subtract one from the other and determine the distance between them, because there's a fixed distance between consecutive members in the sequence. Temperature is another example. Given any two temperatures, you can count the distance between them in degrees. It's 20 degrees higher than it was yesterday or whatever. Interval scales have an ordering, so you can tell if one is larger than another. You can quantify the distance between any two values. And you can add or subtract values. For example, you can you have 30 degree temperature something and you add 10 degrees, you get 40 degrees. Or you can subtract two dates to get the number of days. So you can add or subtract when you have an interval scale, but you cannot multiply or divide or compute a ratio. For example, there's some dates. It doesn't make sense to say one date is five times another date. It, it, it's a meaningless statement. Mathematically, what this means, if you have an interval scale, it means there's not what they call a true zero. You can put the zero value anywhere. Now, to illustrate this, time. We don't have a precise measure of when time began. So what we do is we measure using an arbitrary zero point. Years are measured, for example, in so many years before or after a basically arbitrary date. Microsoft Excel, if you look at the dates, if you, if you put something in date format in Microsoft Excel, it is measured in terms of days since the date I've indicated there. The, the Microsoft Excel value for 
December 31st, 1899, is zero. It's an arbitrary zero point. January 1st, 1900 is one. January 2nd, 1900 is two, and so forth. But that's an arbitrary decision that Microsoft made. Um, scientists typically measure time in terms of years backward from the present. So their arbitrary zero date is today, and then they go backwards. Now here's some other examples of interval scales. Temperature, map coordinates, longitude or latitude, map direction. Um, it makes sense to add or subtract. It makes sense to measure the distance, but it doesn't make sense to multiply or divide. Now, this is an important point. A common error is to assume you can compute ratios or averages for items that are only on an interval scale. And we'll show, as we'll show coming up, that's not valid. You can compute ratios between items, or pardon me, you cannot compute the ratio between items, but you can compute the ratios of their differences because the differences are integer numbers because there's a fixed distance between any two. So as an example, age. A parent's age could be twice that of their child because what is age? Age is the difference between the current date and your date of birth. So your date of birth is sort of the arbitrary zero. The current date is so many days from that, and so the distance is an integer number, and therefore you can compute ratios there. Finally, let's talk about ratio scales. This is where you can do multiply and divide, and it means that ratios are meaningful. And these are some examples of things that are typically on a ratio scale. Uh, speed is a ratio scale, and that means like 60 miles an hour is twice as fast as 30 miles an hour. Notice that there is a true zero in this case. Zero miles per hour is a particular value. Uh, because you have a ratio scale, you can compute an average or a mean, and there's lots and lots of things out there that we compute averages for. There's one other scale often used in data analysis called an uh, absolute scale. Uh, basically says all mathematical operations are of meaningful, which means a square root and all the rest of it. This is occasionally useful for certain kinds of applications, although we won't worry about it too much here. Some people define absolute scales in such a way that only positive values are permitted. There's all sorts of definitions of what is an absolute scale. But as a little exercise, just to think about it, look at clothing size. This is a typical set of clothing sizes. What kind of a scale is it? You might want to think about that and see what you come up with. Now. I want to summarize all this by saying that this is a little chart that shows the four scales I've mentioned and the characteristics that each of them represents. There is a handout uh, on your screen that you can download, and I recommend you do that because this little handout will be useful in further discussions, particularly in the upcoming uh, parts of this webinar series. Okay, let's finally talk about sample size, and I know we're running a little late, but I'll go through this fairly quickly. If you have a large number of entities and you want to determine their properties by taking a typical example, the question is, how big does your sample size have to be before you can draw reasonable conclusions? Let me just define a couple terms. The population size is the total size of whatever you're measuring, and the sample size is the number you choose to measure to figure out what's typical. Okay, sample size is too small. It turns out you get very biased results. Why? Because individual items that are unusual, will, if you happen to choose them in your sample size, they have very heavy impact on the results. Whereas if you um, have a large sample size, you tend to smooth out the quirks. Here's an example. What percentage of SIGSOFT members have gray hair? Let's suppose you're trying to figure that out. And let's suppose you have a whole bunch of SIGSOFT members at a SIGSOFT event, and there they are. Suppose you examine five of them, and two of them have gray hair. 
is it reasonable to conclude that 40% of SIGSOFT members have gray hair? Probably not. But what if you examine 100 of them and 40 of them have gray hair? Well, maybe that's a little more realistic conclusion. Well, what if somehow or other you were able to examine 1,000 random SIGSOFT members and 400 had gray hair? Then you'd probably say, well, it's probably a pretty good conclusion that 40% of SIGSOFT members have gray hair. Well, this is the point about sample size. The larger your sample size, the more accurate your likelihood that your decision is correct. Now, how do you use this incorrectly? Well, here's an example. This is actually based on a presentation I saw when I was working in industry. Somebody says, we measured 24 smartphone apps, and we concluded that our typical app has 23.7 defects per 1,000 lines of code. Now, the whole point of this measurement was to uh, estimate how much time was going to have to be spent fixing defects in code. Well, the problem with this is, is this a meaningful conclusion from only 24 apps? And the answer is, that depends on what percent of all your apps this number represents. If it's 100%, it's a very solid conclusion. If it's only 1%, it's not a very good conclusion. So that's an example of misusing or misinterpreting data because of too small a sample size. I see that a lot in software. And before we finish up, and I know we're running a little late, I want to talk about a couple of dangers of ignoring these principles. The basic problem is we attach undue credibility to numbers. They don't mean what we think they mean. We delude ourselves into thinking we have a sound basis because we have numbers to justify it, even though we have drawn the wrong conclusions or have drawn conclusions that are not valid. Um, and that may lead us to wrong conclusions and wrong decisions. I found this quote in one of the Harry Potter books that I thought was kind of relevant to this. Um, as an example, let's suppose we have a test organization that assigns a scale to test failures. Maybe it has to do with the cost of fixing the problem. And we have blue, green, yellow, and red. Blue has the fewest, red has the most. This is an ordinal scale. If you think about our scales, it provides a ranking but no ratios. And there's not a fixed distance between values. There's no fixed distance between red and yellow or whatever. So it's only an ordinal scale. So it doesn't make sense to add, subtract, multiply, or divide these numbers. But let's see how we misuse this. We arbitrarily assign numbers to the colors. And then we're tempted to make meaningless statements like our average error improved by this percent. If you think about this, we're computing averages using formulas on numbers, but the numbers are meaningless in terms of what an average would be. And this is an example of how we typically misuse numbers and measurements in software engineering. Another example you see quite a lot is you have a customer survey that ranges from very poor to very good. And the scale is not a ratio scale or an even an interval scale. So what does it mean to say our average customer rates us as good? Half very good and half poor, does that really mean good? I don't think so. Um, the key thing that we do wrong here is we look at the properties of the numbers and fail to consider that the thing we, the attribute we are measuring with those numbers may not have that same characteristic. Uh, the numbers may have a ratio scale, but the thing we're measuring may not. And a good example is temperature. Let's suppose that yesterday it was 0 centigrade and 18 centigrade today, and yesterday it was zero, 32 Fahrenheit and 64 today. Is it twice as hot today as it was yesterday? Well, the answer is no. But we frequently see people saying things like that. But 64 is, in fact, twice 32, but the temperature, the concept of um, twice as is not a meaningful concept for temperature. And the error, the mistake we make is assuming that the properties of the number system apply to the attribute we are measuring. And we do this very often in software engineering, which is why we need to pay attention to this issue. 
I think one of the examples we're all very familiar with that turns out to have the same flaw is student grade point average. Uh, there's two students here, and they both have the same grade point average. But if you were interviewing them for a job, you wouldn't consider them equal. Um, you'd probably want to pay a lot of attention to which course the student got the A's in and which course the student got the D in as a factor in deciding whether to hire the student. And student two might either be considered a lot more desirable or, or a lot less desirable, depending on which courses they took. And so the point is, Equal grade point average doesn't mean equal students, and it's a, a good example of something that is theoretically flawed and can lead us to making poor decisions. Okay, this is the end of part one. Uh, the next webinar in two weeks will move on to some very basic data analysis techniques. What we covered today are topics that have to do with just basic information, primarily the scale of measure topic. So now it's time for questions. So Robert, do we have any questions? Thank you, Dennis. We actually have quite a few questions. Uh, the first question is actually just asking what your opinion is and, and how you feel if there has been an improvement in software measurement effectiveness over the years. Well, I, I would say that there has been an improvement but unfortunately, uh, it's a very small improvement. Uh, there's an awful lot of things we measure routinely and we think are numerically sensible that are, uh, are really not, and uh, they can lead us to wrong conclusions. The, the example I showed about grade point average was a good example because we're all accustomed to thinking oh, a 3.0 student is this, and a 3.5 student is that, and a 4.0 student is that. But as I think I illustrated there, uh, that really we, we tend to imply more meaning than is really the case. In my experience in industry, um, it, we have made improvements in terms of understanding uh, what numbers mean when people present numbers, but one of the reasons for doing this series of webinars is that so many times I encounter people who don't seem to understand these basic principles, and therefore they draw conclusions that are very questionable from a measurement theory point of view. So I would say we've made improvements, but not nearly as much as I would like to see. And, and I think one of the reasons is that very few computer science courses even cover this type of topic. Now, maybe it's covered in a statistics course, but that's about it. So that's my answer. So early on in your talk, you used the example of color uh, when talking about nominal scales. Right. Uh, but does not color have a natural ordering? Uh, color is based on wavelengths. Uh, could you well, not order based on the wavelength? That's correct. Uh, well, you could, and for example, temperature could, there is a natural order in temperature based on uh, something having to do with the density of the molecules, but in order for that to uh, be meaningful, you have to use a Kelvin scale. When you use centigrade or Fahrenheit, you no longer have a connection between your scale and this natural order. So, um, Yes, technically speaking, on the case of temperature, there's a natural order, but your scale doesn't really represent that. Now, with regard to color, yes, there is a natural order if you want to look at wavelength, but it's not very common for people to use color as a scale for the purpose of ordering things by wavelength. It's usually more a question of which color do I want put on my shirt, or which color do I want to paint my house, and which colors go together. And so our, our use of that and our attribute that we're trying to measure is not the wavelength. It is some other characteristic, such as does this color go well with that color. So yes, it is true that there's a natural order, but we don't normally use it in that fashion. 
Thank you. So in your opinion, do you think the problem here is that people are inappropriately applying statistical techniques, or is the problem simply that there are simply harder to quantify characteristics regarding software? Well, I think people are inappropriately applying techniques because they perhaps never really learned about some of these issues. I don't think people are intentionally violating these things. I think it's more a question of they never thought about it. Uh, as, as far as um, things being hard to measure, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind about what we measure when we're measuring software things. We, we have to give some thought to what is the attribute I'm trying to measure, what do I know about it, does it make sense to assign a number to that attribute, and if so, what kind of a scale applies here? The, the thing that I think is, I think most people don't go through that train of thought, and uh, I don't know that software is any harder than anything else, it's just that I don't think we have perhaps thought through which characteristics really make sense here. I, th I think if I were to talk about this subject to, let's say, mechanical engineers, I could probably find examples where they don't think through this process either and therefore use numbers in a way that perhaps is not quite correct. So we're getting a lot of questions here regarding sampling, uh, which is probably not too surprising. Um, a lot of the questions are asking uh, along the lines of, you know, is there a smallest sample size uh, that is considered statistically rigorous? Uh, questions regarding continuous variables. Uh, is there anything you can, in the next one minute, kind of uh, summarize or guide people on, on sampling data? Well, the first thing I want to say is uh, we're going to address some of that in one of the future uh, parts of this series. We're going to talk about the concept of margin of error and the concept of uh, various things related to that that will partially answer the question. Uh, as far as minimum sample size, um, everything I've seen in the, the statistical volumes says it, it depends <laughs> on the circumstances. Uh, sample size, uh, what is the size of your sample as a percentage of the total is an important concept. But there's also a, a question of how, how well have you selected your sample. In other words, if I were to take a sample of people in the United States and let's say I took a sample that's 1% of the population of the U.S., well, if I took people from all across the U.S., that would be very different than if I picked all the people from one region of the U.S. For example, if I took my 1% sample by taking people in New York and ignored the rest of the states, I might get a conclusion that is not very valid in terms of describing the whole U.S. population. Whereas if I selected uh, an equally representative portion from every state, I might get much more accurate results. So it's it's not just a matter of sample size, it's also a matter of the way in which you select your samples. All right, thank you very say, much. We'll say more about that in the future webinar. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time today, but thanks again to Dennis for his informative presentation and insightful answers to the many questions. Special thanks to each of you for taking the time to attend and participate in today's webinar. And as a reminder, this is part one in a four-part series, so we hope to see you again in two weeks. This webinar was recorded and will be available online in a few days at www.sigsoft.org slash resources slash webinars.html. You can find announcements on upcoming ACM and SIGSOFT webinars and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and www.sigsoft.org. Note that the slides, oh, sorry about this. Uh, on behalf of SIGSOFT, the speaker, and myself, thanks again for joining us, and I hope you will join us again in the future. This concludes today's webinar.